Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret podcast, our summer sessions continuing here. My name is Jeff Sharon, and this is part two of our conversation with former UCF basketball point guard Al Miller. If you missed part one, make sure you go back and listen to it first. This is the second part of this um, two-hour conversation that, um, that I had with Al detailing what happened to him after um, he was suspended from the basketball program in 2003, and uh, it was a um, truly remarkable conversation with a lot of uh, twists and turns to his life since then. But in the end, it really is uh, a happy story, a happy ending, certainly. Just a reminder to you that this is two hours spread across two podcasts, uh, and, uh, and we are airing this essentially uncut. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to make sure that we did it that way, just so that you got the full story and the full scope of our conversation. It's a quick recap. Of course, you remember Al playing point guard for UCF during the Kirk Spira days in the Atlantic Sun Conference from 1999 to 2003. And, uh, we pick up the story actually from, uh, 2012 when, uh, he decided to turn himself in. Uh, to the Orlando County Jail and face the music for what happened nine years earlier. And he is facing at least 10 years in prison. So uh, without further ado, let's dive back in. This is part two of our conversation with Al Miller. So you were in the county jail for how long? Five and a half months. What happened after that? How'd you get out? Okay, so... Kelly would come and visit me once a month, roughly. And the, the purpose of his visit was obviously to check on me, but for me, more importantly, was what's going on with my case. Have we been able to touch base with um, with the state, and what are we up against? And for the first five months, Kelly really didn't have any information. Al, I'm trying to get a hold of the guy. He's not getting back to me. Um, you know, just keep your face, keep your head, stay out of trouble. Um, everything, everything will, will show his face sooner than later. And so he did that the first month, the second month, the third month, around the third or fourth month, I'm, I'm discouraged. And I'm saying, what the hell is going on? And, and Kelly was saying, I'm, 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 I'm doing the best that I can. I'll just be patient. Now at this point, when I reflect back on this season of my life, uh, there was some resentment, there was some bitterness, there was some anger that I was dealing with. Uh, several things that I that I probably suppressed as a young kid leading up to college, leading up to the decision that I made that night. I think oftentimes we harbor on to uh, different emotions, and if they're unhealthy, at some point they're likely to come to a boiling point. So now that I'm finally sitting still and I'm caged in, um, you know, all of these things are kind of, showing their face and it was something that I've never really had to deal with even when I had the warrant for my arrest I was able to travel I was able to eat um, at my leisure and eat what I wanted um, I was able to stay in in, in, in the con- con- confinements of my own home or hotels and so I still had a sense of freedom although I was very much in bondage I still had a sense of freedom but uh, once you get into that that, that jail cell um uh, you, you lose you lose the freedom that you you once knew and so um, I'm dealing with all of these different emotions Jeff and 
And so there's some people that I feel were going to show up for me during this season in my life, and they're absent. So you, you, you know, it was a, it was a time where I really got to see who was truly there for me, and who may have just been riding, um, riding alone for the ride when everything was was sunny and peaches and cream. And so I'm dealing with all of these emotions. Um, not to mention, obviously, I'm facing double digit prison years. Uh, so, so this is this is probably the epitome, the epitome of me being broken. I was broken when I first got in trouble in college. Um, my first few years with the warrant where I decided I wasn't going to go to court um, probably established even a more intense brokenness. Um, but I was able to put a Band-Aid over, over a gunshot wound with, with travel and food and whatever my sources of medication was at the time. But now that I'm in this, this jail cell, there's no way to self-medicate. All the devices that I use to kind of suppress what I was dealing with, uh, they were now... Uh, on full blast. And so I got a revelation one day that in order for me to receive this second chance that I was praying for, uh, in order for me to to gain some sort of leniency or remorse from the, the judge and uh, the state's attorney and, and even the victim who was involved in my case, I needed to be forgiven. I needed these people to forgive me. And so there were some people in my life who I was extremely frustrated with and that I hadn't forgiven for, for their lack of loyalty. And so uh, it was around my fifth month, my fourth, fourth I think it was the four, probably around four and a half months where I got a revelation that I needed to make some phone calls and write some letters to some people that I had been harboring resentment towards. And I wrote my letters, I got on the phone, and I made those phone calls. And Kelly came and visited me a couple of days after I got that off of my chest. And when he came to visit me this time, he said, Al, I had a chance to meet with the state's attorney. I was in court, he was in court, and we walked out and bumped into each other in the hallway. And I, I'll go, no, I'll save that for the book, Jeff. I'm, I'm going to hold that one to myself. But okay. ultimately, while they met, in the hallway, um, Kelly explained that, hey, I was in the county jail. Did you receive the package that I sent over to your office in regards to Alfred Miller? And he said, yes, I did. I had a chance to read over it. Um, at that time, Kelly advised me to gather as many character vouchers, notarized character vouchers uh, from taxpaying citizens with, with no records, and reputable um, character background checks. <clears throat> and, and we did. So I had former coaches. I had, um, I had businessmen. I had, um, I had pastors from various churches that I had, had attended. Um, I, had, uh, I had several different people. I had former teammates. A lot of my teammates wrote letters on my behalf. Uh, and so... We comprised a, a stack of letters uh, attached with with identification cards so that, you know, the powers that be could reach out to these people and speak to them personally. And, and that was that. And so the state's attorney said, yes, we were able to read over the letters. Kelly, what is it that you would, would want for Al? What is it that you, you know, are asking from me? And in so many words, Kelly just said, if you look at the, the, the guy's history, he hasn't been in any more trouble. He, he wasn't in any trouble prior. Uh, he hasn't been in any trouble since. This is a bad decision he made. He's turned himself in to make amends. And we're just asking for leniency. It wasn't even a number um, that we really had in mind. I was honestly prepared to do um, the minimum of 10 years that I ran away from, but I was hoping that it would be lesser than double digits. Um, so Kelly requested a downward departure, uh, which would take the armed robbery charge with a firearm to uh, to a charge of aggravated assault with a firearm, which carried which carried three to five years. Uh, so uh, so he said, "Well, let me 
let me look into that. It wasn't an impossible option. Uh, he would have to reach out to, to his higher-ups, and he would have to reach out to the victim that was involved in my case. Uh, and he said, if, if these people are willing to, to uh, not further press charges and, 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 and push the issue any further, uh, perhaps this is something that we, we can come around to. And so he put Kelly on hold and told him that he would get with Kelly. I think he gave him a week or two weeks to reach out to the people he needed to reach out to. And at that point, Kelly came to visit. So uh, as I mentioned, shortly after I had forgiven the people that I needed for, to forgive, life would just so have it that Kelly came to visit me a few days later. And this time was the first time that he said, Al, I, I have some information for you. And around the four, four and a half to five month mark, I'd really stop wrestling with um, what, or I'd say I relinquished the control. Um, I guess growing up where I grew up and, and, and even being a point guard, we're, we're typically used to um, organizing things and getting everybody in place and trying to set up things so that we could have a favorable outcome. And I, I live most of my life like that. And so having to sit still and lose control of uh, my future was extremely uncomfortable. But around five months in the county jail, I'd really said, you know what, God, do what you will with me. Strangely, um, strangely, what, what was once abnormal and foreign to me because I'd never been um, in jail for this extended period of time, it, it starts to become normal. And you start to realize um, if this is what has to be done, I can do it. And so after forgiving the people and really coming to grips that there's purpose on my life, whether it's in prison or whether it's out in the world, uh, I started to feel less pressure about what the outcome of my case was going to be. And I started to feel more comfortable with the idea that I got my name back. I'm on track to getting my life back. And this is the process that I have to go through. So Kelly came to visit me and he shared with me that he was able to touch bases with the state's attorney. And that the state's attorney was going to reach out to the people he needed to reach out with to figure out uh, what my options were. At this point, you know, Kelly said, Al, the next time I come to visit you, we will know exactly what your future holds. So I went back to my cell. Um, I talked to God the way that I talked to God, and I was comfortable with it. I was cool with it. Um, I think Kelly may have came back roughly, I don't know, I can't tell you exactly. I would imagine two weeks later, two to three weeks later. And um, they called me for a legal visit. And so as I walked into the visitation room, I knew that, you know, this was the walk that would pretty much lead me to whatever the next few years of my life were going to be. Uh, but I was comfortable. I, was, I, I, I found a peace that surpassed all understanding. I can't tell you. It's important that I mention God in this, in this interview because when I was at my, my lowest mm -hmm. and, and in the darkest place that I'd ever been in, I looked up and I started to talk to God. I'd always talked to him. Um, but at this point, I was up against an impossible situation that couldn't be fixed in my own will. And so that's who I, that's who I, that's who I reached out to. And so uh, I found peace. In the midst of everything that I'm up against, I found peace. So as I'm walking towards this, this visitation room to meet with Kelly, I know that... Um, I'm about to get the answer to my fate. Uh, and so as I walked into the, the visitation room, Kelly was sitting there with a straight face, as he always does. And Kelly actually told me, Al, I have the information that you've been waiting on. And I said, well, what is it? And he said that they have added an additional charge. And when he said that, my heart dropped, Jeff, because what that meant to me was more time. Yeah. On top of whatever I was facing, it meant more time. 
but Kelly and I had developed a a pretty close relationship at this point. Uh, he went on to say they added the aggravated assault with a firearm. And at that point, I had been studying and reading and really educate, educate myself on the law. So when he mentioned that, um, I was kind of torn because I knew that that was a lesser charge of the two that I was up against. So he'd actually played somewhat of a prank on me. <laughs> and he said um, how they gave you the aggravated assault uh, with a firearm and it carries three to five years. When he said three to five, I knew, oh, no matter what, uh, if, if, if this is what I'm up against, this, this, was a, this was a home run. I mean, I couldn't have asked for uh, a, a, a more appropriate sentence based on what the law was. And so, um, ultimately, uh, we were able to work it out to where I got a three-year day-for-day sentence. And so, he explained to me the details of the situation. And uh, while I sit here and I think about it, uh, God showed up. Uh, my situation... Uh, didn't involve any other co-defendant. I did what I did alone, and there was no one to point the finger at. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I had I had invited Baranti out with me on that particular night, and it hurt my heart to hear that Baranti passed away a couple years ago. Um, in fact, it's been more than a couple years now uh, because I never got a chance to apologize to him. Uh, I'll say the details of how I ended up uh, getting involved in that in that in that in that charge that particular night. Hmm. But it wasn't it wasn't Laurenti's fault at all. Um however, um once I was arrested, um I held some sort of resentment to Baranti for for, for, for a while. And Baranti tried to tell me, Al, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Baranti didn't have a clue of what I was about to do, for the record. He just didn't know. But um, but I felt like, you know, if he was more aware or in tune, at the time I just didn't want to accept full responsibility for my actions. So these fans, wherever you are, if you're listening, I love you. And I, 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 I apologize for for how we uh, how we finished off our relationship here on Earth. But um, I appreciate you, bro. And so uh, they ended up giving me the three years day for day uh, while I met it at this particular point in the conversation. I want to thank Mr. John Mullins, who knows exactly who he is. If it wasn't for him having a a softer heart and... uh, and not wanting to really press the issue. It's now 10 or 12 years later, but he could have still felt some type of way. But fortunately, uh, he was he was, he was was open and willing to not really um, pushing the issue of me being punished any more than what the state felt I deserve. And so uh, I wish him uh, the absolute best. I hope he and his family uh, have continued blessings and success. He's done extremely well. Um, hopefully I get an opportunity to meet him one day. And uh, if not, I'm grateful for the way he chose to to move forward with the situation. So that, that's, the, uh, that's the, the, the truth of the matter. I was sentenced to three years. Um, I, sat in the, I sat in the county jail for roughly five and a half months, I believe. And um, once I signed the deal for three years, they shipped me out to uh, – a temporary prison facility uh, that you sit in for a couple of months while they decide which part of Florida they'll ship you off to. And so I got five months in the county jail. I got roughly two and a half months into the temporary um, prison that I sat at. And so I'm roughly two and a half, two and almost eight months away from my freedom at the point where I get shipped to the, uh, to the Clearmont uh, Correctional Institution. That's where I did my time, just outside of Orlando, maybe 35 to 40 minutes away 
um, I uh, I was in Claremont, Florida, mm. and that's where I did the, the the majority of my three years since. So the time goes by, and then comes the day when you have your freedom again. I, I, I'm I'm reading a report. I, I, was it sometime in 2014? Uh, so in I came home June 2015. In 2014, okay. I had learned that I had qualified for what they call a work release program, where I now get to leave the prison, and it's basically a re-entry program to prepare you to get back into society. So you pretty much stay at a living facility. You're still considered a, a, a state prisoner. Um, they allow you to find work. You pretty much have a curfew. Um, you have to provide your work schedule weekly, and you're allowed to go to work and come home after work. Um, and on the weekends, they grant you furloughs at a certain point once you've been in the program and stayed out of trouble. So at this point now, my, 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 my mother's able to come down and visit me, um, and it's not through a glass like it was in the county jail. Mm-hmm. So she came to visit me at the prison. She, she now gets to sit across from the table with me um, in the visitation room. Um, but now I'm actually able to take her out to a restaurant, or she's able to take me to a restaurant. Um, we're able to to wear regular clothes. Uh, we're able to, to have a cell phone at the facility that I was at. So now I can reach out to, um, to really start to... to, to to prepare for my, my road to redemption, so to speak. So uh, it was just one more step to freedom. I didn't talk to you about the prison life and the different jail uh, jobs that I had mm-hmm. uh, that kind of kind of showed me the process to, to really take the responsibility and, and building my character up to a place where, uh, where now I'm not so much judged on my past, but I'm judged at how I, how I wake up and I handle myself through each day, right? So yeah. it was really the rebuilding process of me getting my, getting my character uh, back intact and really rebuilding my name to a place where I felt like it, it, it always deserved to be. I just had to be willing to do the work to get it to where it needed to go. What'd you do on work release? My first and only job on work release um, was. At a sports bar, coincident. I worked at a people Brady's. I'm sure you're familiar with Brady's. Yep. Uh huh. And uh, it was a uh, it was a gift, man. It was a gift because I found myself in a restaurant uh, with with TVs with basketball on for most of the day, whatever season it was, whether it was football or basketball, sports were were pretty much always on. And so I was able to, to kind of reconnect what was going on outside of the newspaper. And so that was my job. I was a cook at Beef O'Brady's for roughly a year. I think I was at work release for a year and maybe two months, if I'm not mistaken. I think 14 months. Mm-hmm. So at the end of that 14 months, you're, you, w- tell me about the day when you were finally, when you had, you'd finally finished off the debt that you had to pay. What was that like when you finally got out and you were free? Okay, well, let's let's prior to to the actual day of me getting out, mm-hmm. I started to kind of, to the best of my ability, jot out revelations that I had gotten, things that I felt like I wanted to do. Um, I, I knew the importance of having a plan uh, rather than just getting out and winging it. And so I, I first reached out to, UCF to find out whether or not I could take classes while I was away in prison. Um, I had I had reached out to some staff at the uni- I mean at the prison camp, and I'd explained to them who I who I was that I was a, a college student prior to me uh, getting in trouble, and that I really I really wanted to finish my education if it was an option. Um, UCF didn't offer correspondence classes through the mail. Uh, at the prison. Um, however, the Ohio University did. So 
I filled out the information to attend the, or not to attend, but to enroll in into the Ohio University. And unfortunately, I was a business major. They didn't offer the correspondence classes that I needed in order to graduate. So I was unsuccessful at taking classes while I was away. But I started the readmissions process uh, into UCF uh, around the time that I was about halfway through my work release process. I knew that it was coming up. I filled out the application. I reached out to the powers that be, and I explained to them my situation. They scheduled me to meet with a board. I guess it was an ethics board mm -hmm. to basically discuss my readmissions process. So I left the work release program with an interview for readmissions to get back into UCF two days after I was released. So my, my, my vision was um, I'd, 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 I'd written more than I'd ever wrote in my life while I was away. And I really just went, went back into my past and, and I started to write all the monumental moments that had taken place in my life. So from, from a young age, losing my dad to losing my mom, to my community, to basketball coming into my life and taking me across the world, um, to college, no, to, to Maine first, mm -hmm. to college, to, to my mistake. And it really became my therapy. So um, I knew that I wanted to write. Uh, in fact, my attorney, when I first reached out to Kelly, he explained to me, Al, what have you done over these last 10 years? And when I gave him all of the details of what I'd done, he said, Al, um, although I'm your attorney, I'm going to talk to you from a, a business standpoint, and I, I really feel like your story and your life, um, at the very least, can help so many people. So you need to write, Al. You need to write. And so I wrote it all down while I was away. So I had the vision of, of speaking to the youth. I had the vision of... Uh, of reaching out to the former AAU programs that I played for under Nike and Adidas, um, the teams that we played against where I still had um, good relationships with the coaches or the founders of those organizations. I reached out to the high schools that I attended, the high school coaches. Uh, I reached out to UCF and the University of Maryland. I knew coaches um, at all of these different programs. And I pretty much explained to them my story and my journey and what had happened to me, what led up to, to me being in prison. And I explained to them where I currently was writing them from and my goals upon my release. And I explained to them that I really felt an extreme passion and purpose to, to step out and speak to the youth so that they wouldn't make some of the same bad decisions that I made that led me to where I was. And so um, I got several response letters back. You know, a lot of coaches, complimented me on, on my willingness to go back and fix my life and they told me Al we'd love to have you come speak to our program and so I knew that that was one of the things that I would do upon my release I had already had several um, speaking engagements lined up before I left um, and then I wanted to get back in school and finish what I started mm -hmm. uh, so upon my release my mom picked me up at the work release center um, which was in St. Petersburg Florida uh, uh, shout out to the St. Pete Work Release Center and all the folks who who share space with me during that season of life. Uh, I met some pretty good people in that journey. Oftentimes, I want to erase the stigma that prison is all all dark and dim and just full of nasty people. You know, I think good people make bad decisions sometimes. Um, I'd like to say that you can find anything that you're looking for in prison. So if you go in there with uh, a mindset that you want to enhance your criminal mentality, then that's obviously there. Any drug you're looking for um, is there. But you can also maximize the moment, and you can build yourself up, and you can educate yourself, and um, you can find great relationships in prison. I won't say that there's many of them, but I still write several men who still serve in time, and I have some dear people that I consider real close to me who um, who've been in the prison system. So, mm -hmm. um, the day that I got out, my mom came and picked me up 
And the first thing we did was we went to go get some good food. I can't recall. I think I had a steak. Uh, I think I had a steak and potato. Uh, I had an appointment scheduled to get one of my tattoos removed. So I went to go and speak with a doctor who specialized in, uh, in tattoo removal. I had a consultation for that. I did a little bit of shopping. And then I headed to Orlando uh, to check into a hotel because the next day I had my um, my meeting with the readmissions board um, to see whether or not they would accept me back into UCF. Mm-hmm. And so I was extremely excited. I was hopeful that everything that I'd gone through was of great purpose. And now I was on the road to um, getting my life back. At this point, I got my life back. Now it's just it's just a matter of walking it out. And so. I walked into the meeting at UCF with the mindset that if it's meant to be, it'll be. At this point in my life, I've seen, I seen things align really all of my life. It just, it just became so clear that for the most part, when I make good choices and good decisions, I have a favorable outcome. When I make bad choices and bad decisions, it's just a matter of time before um, I have to pay for the consequences of my choices. So at this point, I felt like I, I planted great seed. Um, I made good choices. Um, and I I nurtured uh, a positive outcome at some point, whether at UCF or in whatever else life may have for me. I felt like I had done the work. And, and I believe that you, for the most part, you get out what you put in. And so I felt comfortable about turning myself in. I felt comfortable about, about the choices that I made while I was away in prison. I was extremely disciplined. I studied. I learned a whole lot. And now walking out of the gates to my freedom, I was confident in the, in the man that I had become and the work that I put in. So as I'm walking into the meeting at UCF, I said, if it's meant for me to get accepted into the university again, then it'll happen. And if not, then I know that there'll be another door that opens up along the way and uh, I'll, 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 I'll deal with it as it comes. So in the meeting, um, I sat across the table with, I believe, four board members and they were, you know, they knew of my story from a distance. Many of many, many of them weren't familiar, similar to yourself. They knew what was in the news. They, they, because I reached out to the school, they knew that I had turned myself in and that I was currently on my way home from, from serving a prison sentence. But they really didn't know all of the details. And so I was an open book for the most part, similar to the way that I that I am with you tonight. And so I shared with them kind of what led me up to making my my horrible decision in 2002 that led me to prison, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the depression, kind of my mindset leading up to just, just being aggressive in the wrong way. Um, I don't think that I mentioned to you uh, that the fear of failing and not becoming a a professional athlete or really not investing in what I would do. Pushed myself to be to the maximum to, to, to get or to be the best student that I could be. And so I'm sitting and I'm reflecting on all of those realities and so I think all of that played a part in me just feeling like, okay, um, one way or another, I'll figure it out. But now, after God going through everything that I went through and being in front of the board at UCF, I felt redeemed. I felt, I felt extremely confident in who I was. And so they asked me, you know, the same questions you did. How what, you know, how was your time here at UCF? Um, what was your experience? What led you to uh, to get arrested, right? And, and, you know, how have you turned your life around since your arrest and since turning yourself in? And I was an open book. I shared everything. I was extremely passionate about uh, the bad decision and the mistakes that I made, and I was extremely confident in uh, me making the most out of the situation that I, that I walked back into and turning myself in. And... And we walked away from the conversation. They actually gave me a second interview. They wanted to, I guess, run it by or have discussions amongst themselves and run it by the higher-ups. 
in the second interview, they told me to come back with um, some documents showing that I wasn't on probation or parole. So my situation was I, I was sentenced to three years day for day, and upon my release, I was free to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, the stipulations in Florida, once you're released from prison, is that um, you have two years where you should not get in any trouble um, along the lines of whatever your charge was. If it's a if it's a uh, a violent charge, so outside of that, I was free to go. I just could not get in any more trouble as it related to anything violent, and so. Um, I explained that to to UCF. That was one of their concerns, whether or not uh, I had any any additional responsibility as it related to my release. And so I brought the documents back the following day to explain to them that I I was literally free. Uh, they asked me a lot of questions about um, the gentleman who was involved in my in my case, and they they had they expressed concerns that um, is there any chance that you know, anything, any any potential incidents could happen on campus in connection to my old case. And, I, you know, as best as I could, I assured them that, no, um, I don't see how that would, would be an issue. Um, eventually, they decided that they wanted to pass on reaccepting me initially. They told me that um, I could reapply a year later, which would have been 2016, but at that point, I felt like um, I felt like no, okay, it's meant for me to move on. A great deal of me wanted to to go back and finish where I started my college career and education because I know the sour taste that was left uh, once I once I decided to leave and not attend court. I know the unknown and just the the the. the the idea that w- whatever happened to Al Miller. And so I kind of, you know, I'm excited about the future and, and, and what's happening now because I'll be able to to show up and speak to to, to the importance of a second chance, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, once UCF denied me, I had already started the admissions process um, at the local University of Maryland where I was planning to head back home. And so uh, through relationships there at Maryland, um, I was accepted into Maryland. Um, Initially, I took about a year and a half off. Uh, In fact, I am in the process of starting school this fall on August the 19th. And so I'm extremely excited about that. I think when I came home, uh, I just wanted to eat. I wanted to spend some time with my loved ones. I kind of just wanted to process everything that I got through and immediately get to work. But uh, it ended up taking about a year and a half to two years. Now, I've been home now. July, no, I'm sorry, June would have made two years. June would have made two years. So mm-hmm. uh, so we we came home with the, with the calendar pretty full as it related to speaking to uh, men's basketball programs. I said I would start out with the group of men that are, uh, that walked in the shoes that I walked into. And and so I I, I spent a great deal of my time speaking to the youth. Uh, one of the attorneys who uh, was, was a very close advisor of mine prior to me, um, even getting in trouble. I mean, when I was playing ball and I was doing everything the right way, um, this man was in my life. So he knew me before my mistake. But when I came home, um, a door was open for me to, to, to actually work at a law firm. And so um, he thought that, Al, this would be a great transition for you. Um, I think that your character speaks for itself. I think that you can learn and you can be a great addition to the team. Uh, and so he he extended an invitation, um, and I, I obviously accepted it. Um, I really didn't know what I would do for work. I was concerned that the selling or the felony on my record would stop me from finding decent jobs. Thankfully, um, as I mentioned, I think when we make good, good, good choices and, and we put in the work, um, I think that oftentimes it remains favorable. So I know men who have been in the system and have not been able to find work for several years. 
I know men whose lives are so challenging out here in the free world that they literally choose to commit crimes so that they can go back into prison to get food and to get housing. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, a the system is, it's a harsh reality and it's a dim place. And, and, and so, uh, you know, my goal is to, is to, is to shed light on it and to encourage and inspire uh, that no matter what you've gone through, you can pull yourself up and uh, we're safe you know, you can turn a bad situation into a greater good. And so at, at the moment, I'm working at a law firm uh, as a paralegal. I started out as a legal assistant, uh, and I've since put in the work to to become a paralegal. And um, Wow, that's awesome. Oh man, Jeff, it's, it's, I have to pinch myself at times. And so, um, there are several days when I, when I first started to work for the firm, this is actually the second firm that I worked at. Originally I worked at a firm just outside of DC and it's set right across from a courthouse. And I would watch, I would sit and eat my lunch in a picnic. I mean, I'm sorry, in the park, um, right across from the courthouse. And I would watch guys walking in the court with their families or their kids and their loved ones. And I could, I, I just, I could see myself in those guys. And, and you know, it, it's, it's been a long time coming, but I can relate to, 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 to the struggle and to that, that reality. And, you know, I just, I just want to encourage those folks. There's a population of people um, that's going in and out of the prison system. And so um, I think that I can be a voice to, to not only the prisoners, but, um, to young kids prior to making that mistake. And then to elders who may be going through challenging times, whether it's health, whether it's a change in career, um, whether it's relationships or marriage, um, you know, I can speak to, to the importance of, 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 of being willing to face your fear. And so there's so much meat to the story, Jeff. Yeah. I don't want to over-talk. I definitely don't want to over-talk, but I definitely wanted to share with you. I'm... Um... I'm humbled that you took the time and have been so open about it. I mean, I know that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of people who are in your position would not have been so open about it. And, you know, you spoke a lot about, you know, the fear that you felt, you know, in the 10 years between, you know, 2003 and, and 2000 and 2013 and then, and dealing with that and overcoming that. Um, and I'm I'm humbled by the fact that you <laughs> enabled me to share, you know, to that you shared it with me and with everyone who's listening on the show. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. I just have two two last questions that I wanted to that I wanted to ask for you. I, you kind of answered one of them, which was I was just going to ask you, hey, what are you doing now? But you're, but you know, like you said, you're working at a law firm. You're doing a lot of speaking engagements. Um, are you uh, are you thinking about going to law school? You know, the firm has pushed me in that direction. The yeah. two areas of law that I feel I'm most passionate about are obviously criminal law and then sports law. So to answer your question, yes, that's exactly the point. Um, I have roughly 46 credits remaining before I complete my undergrad. So okay. I'm doing the math. Obviously, I'm working full time um, at the moment. So uh, it looks like it'll take me roughly two years to finish my undergrad. Uh, I'm finishing up in business management, and the firm is offering to pay over 60%, or just about 60% uh, of any 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 law school or legal fee that's great. associated with school. And so I think that's the plan that's laid out in front of me. I didn't see it coming when I first got home, um, but it's it's kind of unfolded that way. The, the, the most important thing to me, uh, Jeff, is that, I wake up and I'm doing the very thing that I feel I'm called to do in life. And I think that with my past and being uh, on that side of, of the law uh, previously, to be on this side of things, I think it makes for an interesting story. And I know the importance of um, having that, that law degree. Um, I think that it gives me a certain credibility. As I speak to you right now, there's people listening, and I'm sure hopefully that there's there's a connection that I have with the people who are listening. But... I think as I continue to walk out this journey and I 
and I and I and I become an attorney. Um, I think that the sport, the the, the story, uh, it, it just adds more validity to everything that I've been through, and I think um, it'll open up more doors. So yes, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I've bounced around the firm. Um, at the moment, I'm working on the commercial side of things. Uh, but I, I have great relationships with all the attorneys throughout the firm, and I try to pick their brains and kind of get a feel for what area I could see myself in the most. And uh, as I mentioned, I think those are the two areas that I'm most passionate about and that I could really enjoy um, just, just digging my teeth and nails in. So uh, we'll see how it turns out. But ultimately, I think that um, it's the road that I've been called to. And uh... – and the last thing that I wanted to, to ask, we, well, it's kind of a two-part question, actually. So a uh, couple things, like how your story kind of resurfaced was um, UCF played George Washington this year, and you came out and you saw the team and you spoke to Mark Daniels. And then earlier uh, in, 20, in January, um, Iowa came to town to play the University of Maryland. I did. And your old head coach, Kirk Spiraw, was there. Tell me about and and reportedly, um, you had uh, you, you met up with Kirk. What was that like? I did. That's a great question, Jeff. So, starting with um, with Coach Spiro, I start there. I hadn't spoken to Coach since I got in trouble in two thousand and two or two thousand and three, and was indefinitely suspended. During that time where I was preparing for trial, we would talk briefly. And to be completely transparent, uh, during those earlier stages of me getting arrested, um, I felt like Coach didn't, he wasn't as supportive as I, as I would have um, as I would have wanted him to be, right? Mm. And I think that Coach may have been one of those examples of people who I may have held some sort of resentment towards um, as a young man uh, without a dad. You know, I think oftentimes coaches to kids can play a father figure. And uh, while I don't want to put more responsibility on a coach than, than should be placed on them, uh, I do believe that a coach is a very important role, especially to, to young adults. And so, uh, in my early stages, um, I had some I had some some resentment towards coach. But as I went through my my rehabilitation process and really just taking responsibility for my actions, coach didn't make me do what I did. My teammates didn't make me do what I did. And once you can look in the mirror and own up for for what you brought to the table, then you can start your recovery process. So during my maturation process. I was able to come to grips with it wasn't Coach's fault, right? Coach did the best he knew how to do at that time. And so at a certain point, I had made up in my mind that whenever life would allow the opportunity for me to to reconnect with Coach, I was going to, to, to go out of my way to reconnect. And, and in doing so, I was obviously going to make sure that I was uh, just a positive light that expressed appreciation for the time we spent um, and the part that he played in my life. And so uh, it just so happened that I moved back to the D.C. Maryland area, um, and Coach was now one of the assistant coaches at the University of Iowa, and he was playing against uh, the University of Maryland here, uh, not far from where I reside. And I, I can't recall whether or not I got – coach's number how did I get coach's number I reached out to him but I said no in fact I did not I had a contact at the University of Maryland who who actually got me backstage in the lockers and I, I the first time that I walked up on coach Spiral was they were practicing the day before the game so they got to the area before uh the game mm-hmm. the following day and they were at their their practice and life works in, in amazing ways I, i'd like to, to send a shout out to natasha chris i'll tell you a funny story um, natasha was the academic advisor for the men's basketball program from 
1999 to, I believe, 2001, okay, when I was at UCF. Mm -hmm. Tasha graduated from the University of Maryland, and she ended up, I believe, taking her first job at UCF. But when she left UCF in 01, she ended up taking the men's basketball academic advisor job at the University of Maryland. So she came back to Maryland. And so Tasha was, was, was one of my favorite people when I was at UCF, and she'd always taken a liking to me. So upon me going through my journey and coming back home to Maryland, Tasha was one of the folks that I reached out to um, just, for, just for advice as it related to my education and furthering my education. So um, through her relationships with the men's basketball program at Maryland, Tasha was able to slide me into – the locker room area, and I caught Coach coming off of the court into the locker room after practice before the game, and he had no idea of of my story or you know me fixing my situation. So um, I'd actually, I believe, I let him walk past me, and then I tapped him on his shoulder, and I said, "Coach Spiro," and he turned around and he saw me for the first time in what's that roughly. 14 years, mm -hmm. give or take. And um, and he looked like he saw a ghost. And he said, Al Miller, how are you? And then that started, you know, I guess that was the icebreaker to a conversation that we've had. Uh, and since then, we've talked several times. Coach was vital in uh, trying to assist me uh, with a with a student hold on my student accounts in terms of my official transcript. So, there was some money involved with me getting my official transcript from the university. And so coach reached out to, to, you know, the people that he had contacts with to just see if there was anything that we could do in regards to me getting my official tra uh, transcript. But I was able to share with coach, um, you know, uh, how I felt my journey, um, how much I appreciated him, how much I've grown since, since the, the, tw the 19, 20, 21 year old that he coached. And um, I wished him the best. I think Coach is a, is a great guy. I think he's a, a, a strategist as it relates to, to, to preparation for, for the game, and I think I was fortunate to have him. I think, I think at a certain po point in our conversation, Coach kind of expressed some things that he, he wished he would have done different as it relates to me and our relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd say that uh, Coach and I are in a good place. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to catch up with him the way we did. And I wish him and his family all the best. His kids have grown up to be great kids. And, and uh, in fact, one of his kids, if I'm not mistaken, um, is doing some coaching. Yeah, Drew is, uh, is an assistant, I think, at Kansas State. At Kansas State, yeah. yeah. And, and then I guess um, my last question for you is, when are we going to see you back here at UCF? You know what? Uh, the schedule has been so hectic that I didn't get to get down there this season, and it was my goal. So while I <clears throat> while I was going through my readmissions process, I had a chance to check out the campus. And when I tell you it's, it's mind-blowing, uh, the way that it's grown and, and transformed into what it is today, the new arena, the football field on campus. I mean, I had the vision that UCF – was capable of growing into the program that it is now, but to see it come to fruition is just a, it's, it's a testament that uh, that I appreciate the, 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 the school that I chose to attend for college. And so to answer your, answer your question, I'll definitely be there, uh, perhaps during the football season, but I'll, I'll, catch, I'll catch at least a couple basketball games this year. I'll give you my word. I'll come down and, and we'll be able to, uh, to sit down and break bread. We'll have something to eat and and we'll catch maybe a sporting event or two, Jeff. Sounds good, Al. I'm looking forward to it, man. I can't wait to see you back down here. Jeff, I, I, I appreciate it. I, I want to thank you for the invitation. I think you were the chosen one, Jeff. I wasn't sure at what point I would make it back to Florida to kind of share a story and, and just serve, really, and just kind of be a light to the youth. But I think the platform and the podcast that you guys have going on, um, I had a chance to listen to – one of your last interviews with 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 uh, Jermaine Taylor, and I just found it an awesome interview. I think it's I think it's great for the the, the 
Golden Knight community and, and just Orlando in general. So I salute you and I, I wish you the best with uh, with everything that you have going on. And and I want to say this before before we close, Jeff. Uh, the important thing that I would want to get across in this podcast tonight is is while my story has has been a uh, you know for seasons a very dark and dim and and and, and, and challenging one. Um, I believe that there's great power in going through pain, and oftentimes you have to be willing to to do the work and take control over your life when you find yourself off course or perhaps not where you envision being in life. And so this is not a, 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 a negative story. This is, this is honestly, um, this is honestly a celebration and, and hopefully, um, your listeners will take that anything is possible. If you, if you fight and put your mind to it, for those of you who are believers, I, I would encourage you to continue to believe in something stronger than yourself. At certain points in life, I believe that life becomes so challenging and overwhelming um, that it's too much for an individual himself or herself to handle. And it, it's okay to believe and hope that there's that there's a way to get things on track. And so for me, um, I credit that to Jesus Christ, but to whomever you believe in, uh, I encourage you to continue to just push and, and press forward and never give up. So, uh, so Jeff, I appreciate you again for the opportunity. And uh, I would want to tell the listeners that uh, I can be reached uh, at the moment uh, at the email address amforpresident at gmail.com uh, if anyone's interested in getting in contact with me for any reason. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, for, for the Facebook viewers, uh, my Facebook uh, is Al Miller Jr. And so feel free to reach out to me that way as well. Uh, we're working on several different things, and I'll continue to keep you uh, abreast, Jeff, and you can continue to put it out to the viewers. But I wish you guys the best. I wish the listeners the best, and uh, I look forward to tomorrow. And once again, I want to um, just give a very special thanks to Al for his um, remarkable um, candidness and uh, and and honesty in the interview, and uh, you know that was a lot of. <laughs> it was a uh, it, like I said, it was one of the most uh, remarkable, um, probably the most remarkable interview I think I've ever done. Uh, and I'm glad that you know, as a fan of who, as a UCF fan, a UCF basketball fan who was coming up at that time in uh, the early 2000s. Um, prior to UCF, you know, and during UCF winning those two straight Atlantic Sun championships, you know, that was always, whatever happened to Al Miller was sort of a hole in the story. And uh, I'm glad that we got to fill in that hole. And I'm so glad to know um, that, you know, Al is doing well. And again, my, uh, my great thanks to him and uh, for his honesty and for, you know, just giving us the time for him, uh, for him to tell uh, for him to tell his story um, up to this point. And, of course, we wish him nothing but the best um, as he continues the road back, and he does such uh, wonderful work up there in his hometown of Washington, D.C., um, trying to help kids get, you know, get, you know, get on the right track and stay on the right track there. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him when he uh, comes back down here to Orlando, hopefully for some basketball, and we can catch up and uh, – and uh, and see him here uh, uh, here at UCF. So, once again, um, thanks again to you for listening uh, to both parts of our conversation with Al Miller here on the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast uh, Summer Sessions. Uh, we've got plenty more uh, coming for you later on in the week. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Banneret. Hit us up on Facebook at Black and Gold Banneret, and uh, go to blackandgoldbanneret.com for all the latest. Um, with uh, that we're following maybe the UCF sports here. It's uh, you know it may be the off season, but there really is never an off season uh, here in the world of college sports. Uh, make sure you subscribe to this podcast if you don't already on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, SoundCloud, and Tune In. Thank you so much for listening. This has been the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast Summer Sessions.
Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. 